today in the frame of Women for Space Series talk that we are work, we are organizing from uh, Women in Aerospace Europe Barcelona, we are really really proud to introduce Dr. Gisela Detrell. Gisela, Dr. Gisela Detrell, <laughs> is graduated in Aerospace Engineering at the Technical University of Catalonia. She finished her PhD on rela reliability analysis of life support systems for long duration space missions at the University of Stuttgart in Germany and the, Techno the Technical University of Catalonia. She is currently leading the research group Life Support and Energy System at the Institute of Space System at the University of Stuttgart. Her research includes the analysis and simulation of life support systems and the development at system level of the use of micro, microalgae to introduce oxygen and food for long duration human space flight. Space flight. Gisela is a board member of SONET, that is an organization, a, a sustainable of work network, a community of professionals dedicated to the development of sustainable human settle settlement beyond Earth. Today, she will present to us an inspiring talk about surviving on Mars. Thank you, Gisela. Uh, thank you, Mireia and Anna, first for organizing this event and having me here uh, today uh, talking uh, to all of you. And uh, good afternoon or good evening, everyone, and thank you all for joining today. So yeah, today I'll talk about how we can survive on Mars. And that is quite a wide topic actually. So I will mainly be focusing on life support system, which is uh, my, my expertise, what I'm working uh, or have been working these last years. We will see which systems are currently being used and research and what can we expect in the future. So looking for example, at going to Mars one day. So Mars is a quite hot topic right now. We have seen these last weeks uh, three different missions arriving to the red planet. We had a mission from the uh, United Arab Emirates, a mission from China, and we saw, uh, hopefully most of you saw the NASA Perseverance rover landing uh, on the, the planet some, a couple of weeks ago. We have even heard for the first time how Mars sounds. We have had the first audio from the planet and today or yesterday, we even hear it for the first time how a rover was moving, which, which sound came out of it, of a rover moving on the surface of a planet. That is very inspiring and very exciting, but still we don't have humans there. And uh, Mars is quite a harsh environment for humans uh, if we think about the conditions in the planet. So the Mars atmosphere is very thin and it mainly contains carbon dioxide, which can be toxic or is toxic for us humans. So it's unbreathable for us. And the temperatures there range from 20 degrees, which seems very comfortable temperature, to minus 150 degrees, which is extremely cold for us. So the question is, can we survive on Mars? And, and how can we do that? So these last years, I've been working in a project called MUVA from the SONET group that was just mentioned in the presentation. And uh, in this, uh, within this network, together with uh, experts from other fields, not just engineers like me, but also architects, with biologists, with psychologists, so people from different fields, we work together towards this NUVA project, which consists on a city for 1 million people on Mars. And that was a project presented on the Mars Society competition last year. Uh, I've put the link here on the website, uh, can copy that afterwards on the chat. And uh, that's a presentation of the full project. I will not be talking about the entire project and what we have done, but uh, focusing more on the life support system aspects and not only on NUVA. Uh, so if you feel like uh, knowing more about this, this uh, 1 million people city on Mars, uh, just uh, have a look at our presentation online. Uh, just some words about this project. Uh, what we have envisioned is a city built inside the cliffs of Mars. Uh, so what you see actually here uh, up on the cliff is the infrastructure that would be required to keep the humans alive. And the humans would be living in the wall here. So the amount of surface that we require uh, for the infrastructure for keeping the humans alive is much larger than the area that we are actually using for, for the habitat itself. 
And uh, we don't want humans just to survive inside the city. The city for 1 million people has to be also a nice and a pleasant place to live. So the interiors should uh, look uh, uh, appealing for humans to live there. So that's how uh, it could look like from the inside, having very large green areas and parks, having a nice uh, living compartments. Doesn't look too, that doesn't look too bad, uh, does it? So. My, my, might uh, one day be our house or not. But for now, let's go back to survival on Mars. So for human missions, uh, we need a system which is called the life support system. It is a system that takes care that we humans get all the resources we require on a moon base, on a space station, in whatever closed environment uh, we want to be. And uh, what do we humans need? Well, so we take intake uh, oxygen, potable water, and food. And at the same time, we produce carbon dioxide, we produce uh, water in form of sweat, uh, urine, and feces. We also produce heat. And uh, we don't get it inside us, but we also need hygiene water. Uh, the amount we use depends on each person and the comfort level we want to have. So, uh, you know, not everyone. Uh, takes uh, the same amount of time uh, in the shower. Some people uh, have longer or shorter showers, but we do need certain amount of water for that. And here you can see some of, uh, you can see the numbers of uh, on average, what a human needs uh, in kilograms per day per person. So uh, let's put all of that together and let's see what does that mean for a Mars mission. So let's imagine a mission with six astronauts lasting for 500 days. We would need for that two and a half tons of oxygen, about two tons of food, and a huge, huge, huge amount of water, which again depends on the level of comfort we want to provide uh, to our uh, astronauts going to this Mars mission. But if we put everything together, and also the tanks that we would need for that, we end up in a weight, in a mass range of uh, 27 to 126 tons. And that's only for the consumables that we need to survive. We are not considering here the habitat or any experiments or anything else. That's just surviving uh, consumables. And that would mean probably between, uh, let's say, two and seven Falcon 9 heavy rockets. So that is quite a lot just for surviving. And that's only for 500 days. If we want to stay longer on Mars, that would even be more. So taking everything with us, taking all this water, oxygen, and food is not an option. And we need to find a way to process all this waste that we are humans producing, so the carbon dioxide, water, urine, and so on. We need to be able to recycle those to produce new, fresh oxygen, water, and food. If we rearrange all these elements we have, uh, we end up with the typical classification of the life support system subsystems. So we usually talk about the four management subsystems, and that would be air, water, waste, and food. These uh, different subsystems are not completely independent from each other. As you can see here on the graph, they are all interconnected. A good uh, clear example of that is uh, the food management. If we have plants that uh, serve as our food, these plants will need water, they will need the nutrients, they will, during the day, produce oxygen and consume carbon dioxide, and in the night the other way around. So we cannot treat the food management system as a separate system. They are all interconnected and form a very complex system. Now imagine for a second, what do you do when you travel somewhere? So if you're going hiking for one day or even two, you take everything you need with you. You take the clothes you're wearing, you take the food you're gonna eat, and depending where you're going, and if you don't have options of buying or taking water directly there, you'll even take the water you need for the entire day or two with you. But if you go somewhere for a longer period of time, let's say six months to study or work somewhere, you'll pack your luggage with uh, more things than that. You'll take some clothes with you, uh, not just the ones you're wearing for the hiking, uh, uh, day or two, but you'll take more clothes that you're planning to clean in the place where you're going because you're not taking clothes for six months. So you will be cleaning your clothes in situ wherever you are. And you're surely not taking food or water with you. You may take some uh, 
uh, put as reminder of uh, where you come from if uh, if you want, but you're not taking the, the, all the meals you're going to take for the uh, six months. And that is exactly how it works in space travel. Though. We have to uh, look at the duration of our mission and decide what we do. As an example, we can look at the Apollo missions lasting uh, less than two weeks. And for that mission, recycling was not necessary. It was easy enough to, and, and was uh, not that much uh, material to take, that the astronauts would take the oxygen, the food, and the water they required directly with them and don't really care about what happened with the waste, just collected it and uh, disposed it at some time. So we talk here of an open life support system where the inputs are all fresh and the outputs are all disposed. If we go back to this Mars city of 1 million people, recycling everything is a must. We cannot rely on Earth resources if we want to send 1 million people to Mars. That means that we need to treat all the outputs that are produced and uh, recycle them to produce all the inputs in situ. We might still use uh, resources in situ. We might still, if we are in Mars, take resources from Mars, but be completely independent from, from Earth. There is something in between where we partially take fresh uh, inputs and recycle partially the outputs we produce. That would be a partially closed uh, system. And that's something we do at the International Space Station currently. And we can do that because we're not that far away. The ISS is at 400 kilometers uh, distance and it's still manageable to send fresh resources from time to time. It's not that uh, uh, expensive. So how do we do that? How do we recycle? Um, we need to create oxygen, water, and food. Food is here represented as carbon uh, in this slide. And here on Earth, we have nature and biology taking care of that. We have plants, we have bacteria, we have animals that in one way or another participate in this recycling process. So one possibility for the life support system would be to let's just take living uh, organisms with us and let them work as they do here on Earth. And as we will see, that is quite complicated and quite complex. So the other option we have is to create technologies that are able to recycle. And we are able with uh, these technologies that are based either on physical or on chemical principles, we're able to recycle oxygen and water. But it is not possible to, pro uh, to produce food with them. For that, we need the biology. And if we use one technology or the other or an open system will depend on the duration of the mission as I've mentioned before. And just to give you an, a feeling or an idea of uh, the, the scale uh, I'm talking about uh, if one system is better than the other. Uh, in this graphic, you can see in the vertical axis, the equivalent system mass. We will not go into detail what that means. Let's just call it mass. It implies also the power required and other aspects, but let's assume just system mass uh, for now. And on the horizontal axis, we have the mission duration. So you can see that for missions lasting several weeks, even maybe a month or two, an open system might be okay. It might be the most favorable option in terms of mass. Just take everything you need, don't worry about recycling. After some weeks or months, uh, the physical chemical technology, uh, technologies start being more favorable in terms of mass. We have to uh, keep in mind that recycling means at the end that you have to take the technologies to recycle with you. So you will have a higher initial mass, but the resupply that you will require will be slower. That's why the slope of the yellow line, the physical chemical, is, uh, uh, is uh, less than uh, the, the slope from the open system. So if we go to biological systems here, as a bioregenerative systems described, then we start talking about many, many years, so probably looking at a decade or two, uh, when these systems would start being more favorable. Because yes, we can recycle everything, so we may not need resupply, but the system that we require is huge in terms of mass. As you can uh, see here, the line, or uh, one could say that the, the green line here is almost, uh, or is horizontal. It is not fully. Every system has some loses at some point. So the line is uh, not fully horizontal to make sure we're completely independent from earth resources and compensate the losers, we might need to use uh, resources in situ. And then there's a fourth option, uh, which is called here a hybrid option. And that's a mixing of physical chemical technologies and biological technologies. So we can profit from the physical chemical technologies that we already know and use and add some biological components to it 
to produce partially uh, part of the food, for example, uh, but uh, still relying on the well-known physical chemical technology. So that would be a hybrid life support system. So where are we today? Uh, we have had humans living on the International Space Station continuously for over 20 years now. And uh, there's a life support system there. And the system is capable of re regaining 42% uh, of the oxygen from the CO2 that the astronauts exhale. It's also able to recycle water up to 90%, but it's not able to produce food. And that is because the technologies that we use on the ISS or that are up there running right now are physical chemical technologies. Uh, let's have now a look uh, at these physical chemical technologies that are on board uh, the ISS. I'll briefly go through the different subsystems I've mentioned before, starting with the water management. So water is recycled, recycled on the ISS, as I said before, up to 90%. And there are some technologies being uh, investigated now to increase this uh, percentage even to close to 100%. But right now, this 90% is achieved thanks to two different technologies. One is multi-filtration, which is a system, a complex system with uh, different filters. I'll not go into detail which type of filters those are, but uh, water goes through a series of different filters. And that's mainly used for wastewater, so condensate uh, or iGen water. And uh, another system complementing that uh, is treating the urine from the astronauts. So we have uh, we require a different system to try the urine because we cannot just filter it. Urine is, uh, is very complex and, and has a lot of elements on it. And we require a distillation, distillation system for that. So both technologies are up on the station. They are these two uh, big quarter of, you see these two big cracks uh, you see on, uh, on the picture. So I don't have the, the sizes now on, on my head, how big a rug actually is, but you could imagine a person standing next to it and it will be a little bit higher. Uh, the, the rug would be a little bit higher than, than the person. So it's uh, more than a couple of meters uh, high. So those are the technologies for the water recycling that uh, allow this 90% recycling. Now let's look at the air management system. For the air management, one very important thing is to extract the CO2 from the atmosphere. So we humans uh, exhale CO2 continuously. And if we do nothing, it just accumulates on the atmosphere. Here on Earth, it's not a big problem, but you have probably noticed at some point when you have been in a lecture room uh, or in a room in general with a lot of people with closed windows that after some hours, especially remember my times at university, it starts to feel weird. It starts to feel that the air is not that it's, it's I don't know how to describe that, but the, the breathing just feels different and you solve that by opening the windows and you get fresh air and it's not a problem and it's not just the co2 there are other aspects on that but one of the things is that the co2 is accumulating in the in the in a lecture class with uh, all the windows closed we cannot just open the windows on the iss so we cannot just get fresh air so we have to make sure that on the air that we have on the iss the co2 is removed and to do that, the air goes through either molecular sieves or amine beds, which are materials where the CO2 particles get trapped when air goes through. And that is very important because uh, if CO2 reaches a certain level on the atmosphere, we, st we start feeling uh, sick. Uh, and it can reach up to a point where it's even toxic for humans. So depending on the concentration, uh, we can be present in a CO2 rich atmosphere uh, longer or shorter, so some limits are acceptable for several hours. But if it gets very high in, in minutes, uh, it can be deadly. And uh, once we have extracted the CO2, uh, we have or we want to recover the oxygen out of it. So we need to process the CO2 after it has been extracted. And to do that, uh, a Sabatier reactor is used. A Sabatier reactor processes the CO2 together with uh, hydrogen, and it produces water and methane. Methane can be used as propulsion uh, fuel, for example, or just vented. And then the other thing we get is water. So we are still not getting the oxygen out of the CO2, but we're getting it uh, out in form of water. So the next step to produce oxygen is electrolyzing this water. So separating the hydrogen and the oxygen. So we have water electrolysis. 
Uh, you can see some pictures here on this slide of the different uh, technologies uh, that are mentioned. So you can see they are big gray uh, boxes uh, somehow. Uh, yeah, so, so do uh, physical chemical technologies look like. And as you can see for CO2 removal and oxygen production, there are two different technologies listed here. So CO2 removal, we have Bosduk and Sidra and auto production, electron and the oxygen generation system. That's because there is a Russian and an American technology up there in the station carrying out this task. But besides Russian and America, we also have European technology up there for the life support system. It's quite new. It uh, went up to the station uh, in 2019, and it has been in commissioning phase uh, for quite a long time since. And this technology is able to do all the tasks at once. So we have one of this, these wardrobes with all the technologies required to go from CO2 to oxygen. So there is a CO2 removal system inside the Sabatier reactor and also an electrolyzer. And this one rack is capable to provide uh, in nominal conditions for three astronauts. So we go now to the food management. And uh, well, on the ISS, the life support system cannot produce food. I've already mentioned that before. There have been several experiments, as we will see uh, later on, uh, with uh, lettuce or, or similar vegetables produced on the ISS. But those were only small experiments. So it is far from what we need to produce enough for one human. But astronauts don't eat pills or anything uh, like that, as uh, some movies make us believe. Uh, they eat quite normal food, as you can see here in the pictures. Uh, of course, treat it and packed uh, in a proper way so it can go up to space and last there for uh, long periods of time. So we can have the hydrated food, we can have food in a can, as you can see here in the pictures. So the food up there, it's not that different of what you might have at your house. But there is one tricky thing. Try to imagine how it would be right now, today, to plan all your meals for the next six months and uh, get it right and take the right amount of everything you need to still have a balanced diet and so on. So even if the food looks uh, not that uh, different, the entire process of uh, packaging it properly and pre-treating it properly and planning is quite a huge effort compared to what we do uh, at home, just opening the fridge. And uh, this slide is more a fun fact that's actually part of the life support system, but I always like to show that. Uh, there has been not one, but two Coke dispensers in space. Uh, I think both on, on the space shuttle missions. Uh, they were not called Coke dispensers. They had a more fancy space name, uh, fluid generic bioprocessing apparatus. And there also has been an espresso machine in space. Uh, uh, some years ago when uh, Samantha Cristoforelli was uh, on board the station. And there's, there was even a, a special cup designed for space. So uh, the fluid behaving inside the cup would have the same feeling as uh, when you're drinking uh, your espresso here on Earth. So that's not part of surviving, that's more uh, an add-on to it. But uh, yeah, related to the food on the station. So they also have their, 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 their nice uh, treats up there. And the last one is the waste management system. Um, the, on the ISS, the, the waste produced besides uh, uh, urine and uh, the CO2 that it's uh, partially recovered, uh, the, the solid uh, waste produced uh, not only by humans, but also by, by experiments and so on, is uh, stored and disposed uh, and it's burned during re-entry into the atmosphere with a capsule. It is possible to recycle solid waste, uh, both biological solid waste and non-biological solid waste, but it is very difficult and uh, it requires a lot of resources, energy, sometimes depending on how it's done, it's risky. So at the end, it's very cost intense. And for the missions we have done so far, it's not worth it. So that was on the ISS, what we currently have today. Uh, the question is if we want to go one step farther, not yet the 1 million uh, inhabitant city on Mars, but uh, let's say uh, based on the moon. We need a system that can recycle more than the ISS because we're going farther away. So sending resources there, it's gonna be more expensive and it's gonna take longer. So one of the things we can do uh, is improve physical chemical systems. And that's already happened, as I've mentioned before, uh, water treatment systems to farther close, uh, to get close to 100% is taking place right now. 
other CO2 technologies are also being uh, tested on the ISS right now. So there, there's already work in that direction. But if we want to get more independent from Earth resources, we have to start thinking on how to produce food. So we have to start thinking on the biological components. And that's what I'm going to focus on from now on. So there have been several experiments on space, but also on Earth, looking at how to use biology and how to have how to obtain closed systems. I especially like talking about biosphere too, because it's the biggest, it's an impressive from the size uh, experiment that has taken place on Earth. There have been others in much smaller size that have tried for a certain period of time to keep humans uh, or other living organisms in a closed environment and see how it evolves. Going from a very small experiment with one person and some algae to something as big as biosphere too. Uh, you can see here in the picture, and uh, if you can recognize there's a car here and you can see the size of the tree. So you can imagine how big this building actually is. Uh, it has a surface of uh, 16,000 square meters. It's located in Arizona and it had vegetation or it has, uh, the, the building still exists. It has vegetation from different areas of the wall. So there are different areas with different types of vegetation and it is meant for eight inhabitants. There were two big experiments, one in 1991, the other one in 1994. The first one lasted two years and the second one only six months. And there were several problems with it. Uh, the first uh, two years experiment had a problem, for example, with the, the oxygen levels decreasing and they had to find out what uh, was happening there. Turns out uh, there was more than enough vegetation, vegetation to produce this, this oxygen. But the concrete, the material uh, of which the building was built was capturing CO2 particles. So the plants did not have enough CO2 to produce all the oxygen that was required. So yeah, there were some problems on, on the experiment, but still it has provided us with very valuable results. There is a lot of information that came out of this experiment on how plants grow, uh, the, the, how uh, interactions happen. And one big lesson learned from my point of view, or the biggest lesson we can learn from this experiment is that biological systems are very difficult to control. It is very hard to build an earth inside a house. Doesn't matter how big the house is, it will always be much, 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 much smaller than earth is. And earth has its balances because we have a lot of buffers. We have the oceans, we have a big atmosphere and it can compensate changes. Once you put that in a small volume, keeping that balance is very hard. And that brings me to the next uh, experiment here on Earth, which uh, is also based on bio biological systems, but with a different, a different uh, point of view. That's the MELISA project. That's an European uh, organized by the ESA, but with partners from all over Europe, different research institutes, universities working on this project. And here, the idea is to also close the loop, so also recycle everything. But instead of putting a lot of living organisms together in a big room, trying to focus on different living organisms that carry out a specific task and have them in separate compartments doing their own task in that compartment. So you can see here that the system has uh, four different compartments plus the compartment of the crew. And I'll not go into details what each compartment does, but compartments one to three take care of the waste, both solid and liquid that the crew produces and make sure to produce the nutrients that the plants and the algae require. So in compartment four, you have the green stuff growing that serves as uh, oxygen production and uh, food production and also provides the water for the crew. So we're closing the cycle in a different way. This project has been running for, I think, already 25 years, and it's, it's a long-term project, so it's probably going to be for the next 25 years as well. And it's not that far away from Barcelona. That's uh, in, in Bellaterra. They have the pilot plan, so different uh, organizations uh, within Europe have been developing these compartments, and they are all located uh, on, on Bellaterra in Barcelona in the pilot plan. And the goal there is to test them all together. They still have not closed the loop completely. They have not tested everything together, but they have started already to make compartments work together. So not only testing them independently, but also the, 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 yeah, the process of working together. There have been also other experiments, uh, especially mentioned always these ones because they are mostly not only German, 
and uh, have many colleagues here uh, related to them. Uh, one is Eden ISS, which is an EU funded project. It consisted in two big containers that uh, were sent to uh, Antarctica. And for the first phase for one year, they had plants growing there. This is not representative of space conditions. We do not have uh, microgravity there. There were the, the plants were in gravity as they uh, would be everywhere on Earth. But they could test a lot of things, a lot of cultivation techniques, interaction with the crew, how much time do plants require uh, in an isolated environment. So there were no people living on this compartment. They were living on the station, uh, Neumar uh, station on the Antarctica, but they were going every, I don't know if every day, but every now and then going there with everything that that means. It's like uh, in winter, probably like doing an EVA, you have to take all your uh, winter clothes to get out. And once you get inside, uh, you have to take everything out before starting working. So it, it has a little bit of space filling, I guess. And they also tested a lot of technologies on, on image recognition on plants and things like that. So it's about developing technologies that will help us uh, cultivate in space, even if the conditions in there right now were not uh, microgravity conditions. And so the other one is a project uh, also based on biology and it's a biological system to treat urine. So instead of using the system that it's currently used on the ISS, a potential biological technology uh, would be the crop filter, uh, crop filter, which is the one shown in this picture. And uh, last but not least, uh, in uh, China, there's also a lot happening or has been a lot happening these last years. And they have also a very nice uh, habitat um, the facility, the Lunar Palace one. It starts looking quite a lot like a, like a lunar base in this case. You can see the picture here on the top. I, I cannot read uh, Mandarin, so I have no idea what it's written in there. But uh, we have here the plant habitat and there are crew compartments uh, somewhere here and, and other infrastructure over here. So it already looks like uh, on the direction of a, a moon or a Mars base. And here they have had several experiments with people in there for 100 days also cultivating and living from the plants they had in there. So all those experiments were on Earth. But uh, there have also been experiments on space. I've also mentioned, uh, already mentioned before, the lettuce grown in space, that's uh, from 2013. But the same experiment platform, Beji, it's still used today. There were pictures on the news a couple of days ago of the new, uh, I'm not sure if it was a salad or something similar uh, that was, uh, yeah, just uh, harvested a couple of days ago. There are more fancy technologies like the advanced plant habitat facility also from NASA where plants grow in a closed environment. So we can actually control the environment in there and see how plants react in microgravity to different parameters uh, inside the grow chamber. And besides the American, we also have again, European and Russian technology. Uh, as you can see from the size of the hand from the Russian experiment, the experiments are very small. So as I said before, we cannot produce food for the crew. We're just testing how it could be done or how plants behave in microgravity. I particularly like the European uh, platform. It's uh, no longer on the ISS, unfortunately, but uh, it had something special. It has uh, two rotors uh, where the experiments uh, could be placed. So you can have at the same time an experiment running at one G by rotating the rotor, moving the rotor, and the other one at uh, microgravity. So you could see with all the other conditions being exactly the same, which effect microgravity has. And another option that, that uh, was not used, but uh, could be thing on the future using these this rotor things is uh, we could simulate moon or Mars gravity. So we could actually see the effect on plants, on the roots growing and everything on a partial gravity environment. And uh, yeah, plants are very important and will surely be part of a biological system or a hybrid system in the future. But beside plants, uh, there's uh, something else or beside higher plants, uh, there's algae and microalgae. Um, microalgae have the advantage compared to higher plants that they grow faster, that we can eat all the algae. Uh, while in plants, sometimes you just eat the fruit and the rest of the plant is not uh, edible. They require less water. They use more efficiently light. So in, in a summary, I would describe them as more efficient as, as higher plants. However, we cannot only eat algae, uh, probably because we wouldn't like that uh, because of its taste, but uh, mainly because of uh, its content. 
depending on the species, it will be different. Uh, there are thousands and thousands of algae species, but uh, they are in big part uh, protein. And we humans need protein, but we also need uh, carbohydrates. We also need fat. So we cannot just uh, eat protein uh, every day, 100%. So we estimate that about 30% of our daily food consumption could be substituted by, by algae, but not more than that. So they could complement the diet, but they could not completely substitute them. So I, I work with algae, you know, that was already said, so I'm not trying to sell you algae as the best solution. It is one of the solutions. So we'll probably have seen in the future a combination of plants, higher plants and, and algae. And there have already been experiments in space with algae. Uh, those uh, here shown are not only algae, but actually having more than one living organism uh, compartment in the experiment. Uh, in Omega Hub, there was algae and fish. So it was a closed system where the algae would provide the oxygen for the fish and the fish would provide the CO2 for the algae. And uh, the other one, uh, it even includes microbes. So it was a more complex, uh, even more complex uh, ecosystem in there. But besides that, there has been an uh, experiment from Stuttgart uh, sent to space a couple of years ago. And I'd like to briefly tell you a little bit about that now. So algae uh, grow in uh, photobioreactors. Photobioreactor is the house of the algae. And uh, you can see photobioreactor just next to me here. And the one we designed for the space station uh, experiment looks a little bit different. It was also called photobioreactor experiment, but you can see here it was uh, by the gray box, just like the photo, uh, the physical chemical compartment we have uh, components we have today on the ISS from the outside looks the same. And the goal of this experiment was to test uh, that microalgae could work on space, but that could work together with a physical chemical technology. So this hybrid life support system concept. And for that, we were supposed to be connected to the life support drug. If you remember, it's the European technology I've mentioned before for uh, air management. And as you can see here on this graphic, the life support drug takes the CO2, uh, processes it further, and our algae were meant to take a little bit of the CO2 and from that produce, produce a little bit of the oxygen required by the astronaut and then produce biomass that could potentially be eaten. It was not the goal of the experiment that the astronauts eat our algae, but uh, um, yeah, that, that could be the, the, the result one day. And this uh, blue uh, circle you see here, all these green dots are actually the algae. That's a microscope picture because they are called microalgae because they are very small. So what you usually see is a liquid, uh, green liquid, as you can see here with the reactor I have next to me. Um, you can see here again, this, this gray big box uh, we had and uh, the question might be, or the question I get asked sometimes is uh, how come an engineer like you is working with biology? Well, if we want biology to work in space and produce oxygen and food the way we want it to produce, we need a lot of technology around this algae. We need to make sure that we can provide the right conditions for the algae to grow. And that means we need to provide lighting, we need to provide sensors to control the system, we need the thermal control system. So at the end, it's building uh, like, like a small, uh, yeah, a small satellite, uh, not, not with all the subsystems of a satellite, but at the end, yeah, we have thermal control, we have power, and uh, the algae need uh, to, to move inside the reactor. So we have a pump, so we have a lot of technical things uh, inside, a lot of technology inside a biological component. And just to give you a feeling of what that means, uh, you've seen one reactor next to me. Now in this slide, you can see another reactor, which is nothing else than a flat panel with channels on it. So the algae, which are within uh, a liquid solution, keep moving within this reactor. And that's how uh, the reactor looks like after having a cultivation for 187 days. So we have a very dense algae solution here, uh, or very dense algae concentration inside the reactor. And you can see how the reactor looks uh, nicely green after this 187 days. So what biologists are interested in with uh, these experiments is to see how the algae uh, change or behave in space. So here you can see some pictures of the microscope and uh, the first one, this homogeneous uh, cell distribution is the ideal case, but uh, we sometimes have algae clustering adding up together, which might mean that they all not get the light that uh, they require or the nutrients if they are clustered like that. Or we might sometimes have uh, cell damage. The, the, I've shown before there was a pump in the system. 
So when the algae go through that, the pump that creates stress and it might damage the cell. So we can see here some uh, cell material from a, a cell that it's not longer a cell. So that's interesting uh, from uh, more the, or, or, or even looking inside the cell, it's interesting for, for the biologist uh, point of view. As an engineer, I have this, green, uh, this gray box and what I'm interested is in the performance of this box. So at the end, uh, what I look at as an engineer is this graphics like this one, that's the cell density, how the algae are growing inside the reactor. So we see that the algae uh, start growing. It decreases at some point because the system is saturated. We'll not go into detail into that, but the important is that the algae grow and that the algae produce oxygen. So we have the blue line continuously producing oxygen and consuming CO2. So those are just two experiments we run in our lab uh, to show you as, as an example of the yeah, system performance uh, from an engineering point of view. So we had this experiment ready about uh, two years ago. Uh, in May, it was uh, we had the algae uh, put in syringes that were after inserted in the, the reactor. It was all sent to space and started uh, in June. Uh, you have a couple of pictures here of uh, how it was installed and uh, the experiment started. And finally, some algae after growing on the station, that's the same picture I have uh, here uh, behind me the algae in the station and the last picture, the algae back in our lab for, for analysis. This experiment did not work as planned. As uh, many experiments, uh, we had some prob problems and we also have a lot of lessons learned. And the biggest lesson learned in our case is that we should not be as an engineer afraid of biology. We tend to think this biology is hard to control or predict and the problems we had with our experiment were not because of the algae. The algae grow amazingly for two weeks, but we had some technical problems. We had a loss of power at some point. So some of the electronic uh, probably failed or, or some other uh, technical, but not biological problem. The experiment was meant for six months. So two weeks out of uh, six months, it's, it's very low, but still we, we were happy to see the algae growing for at least these two weeks. And again, learn this lesson that uh, we shouldn't be afraid of biology. Biology is capable of regenerating a pump when it stops working uh, because it breaks, it does not regenerate itself. So we should trust more biology, especially the engineers. And uh, because of this regeneration capability will play an important role for these long duration missions. So I'll briefly go back to Mars now and uh, to the one million city and how does all this I've explained you apply to that or not. So the technologies I've explained you, including the, the, the biologic, biological ones, having some plants and having algae are very likely to happen if we think about a moon base in the coming years. But if we think about the city of one million people, that might sound like science fiction, it's not but it is very far away in the future from now. And here we cannot, and we should not imagine a life support system similar to the one on the ISS today, or not even mixing it with a little bit of algae or a little bit of plants. If we want to think about 1 million people living in another planet, we will have to think about something very similar as we have on earth, and we will rely on biology. And uh, how exactly the system will be, I cannot tell you, but uh, we have, uh, we, we did a preliminary study of how it could be for this uh, NUVA project. And uh, what we decided that was uh, feasible with what we know today, so still not thinking uh, science fiction here, we are still with uh, our feet on the floor. We designed a system with a lot of plants, so 50% of the food comes uh, from crops and 20% from microalgae that at the same time produce enough oxygen and then participate on the water uh, generation, uh, recycling. But then we thought about things that uh, might not be that common for us right now, but that will surely uh, play an important role, like eating insects, which is in Europe not that common, but in other countries, uh, in other uh, countries in the world it is. We also have started hearing a lot about cellular meat and that might also evolve enough uh, so it can be used in the future for, for such a, a Martian base. And also other organisms like mushrooms might also play an important role. And to treat all the waste that all these elements produce and also the humans will surely have bacteria in the same way it's uh, being uh, conceived now in this Melissa project I've uh, explained you before. 
So how do we cultivate plants on, on Mars? You surely have, most of you seen the Martian and have seen how tomatoes, uh, potatoes uh, can be grown uh, on a Martian uh, base. If we design a system for growing crops, uh, we want to be very efficient. And for that, we'll most likely use uh, the most efficient systems we know. We will most likely use uh, hydroponic systems. We will most likely uh, use uh, CO2 rich atmosphere, which might not be good for humans, but uh, plants uh, like to have a little bit more elevated CO2 levels uh, to work more efficiently. And we will also design an efficient lighting system. Mars is farther away from the sun than the earth. So the light we will get there will be a much uh, with much lower intensity. So if we want the plants to grow fast and, and, and efficient, we will need artificial lighting. And uh, we can concentrate our efforts to provide the light that the plants require. We see plants green because they mainly absorb, uh, require the blue and red part of the spectrum. So we can create LED panels focusing on those so we don't, do not waste any energy uh, on green uh, lights or the green part of the spectrum. Still, that requires a lot of power. Here on Earth, we have the sun for free and uh, we don't worry that much about it. But if we use uh, artificial lighting, power is gonna be an important parameter. So we calculated that for this Mars city, we would require 35 kilowatts per person for the life support system. So you can see here in this picture, we are up in the cliff, uh, in the mesa of the cliff, and you can see the green hexagons are the agricultural modules, and it's quite a lot of surface we require for the, the, the people uh, on the city. But we require even more for the energy supply to provide the energy for the city. So we have the 35 kilowatts per person for the life support system, but we will need even more for other systems uh, in the city to building the city itself. So uh, that's the number you see actually here, 117 kilowatts. And that's much more, that's, that's an order of magnitude bigger than what we use here on Earth. So energy will be an issue or one of the, the main difference of uh, what we are used to here on Earth. And with that, I come to the end of my presentation, but before ending, I'd like to give you an, uh, or leave the presentation uh, or end the presentation with an important message. And it is the, the one or one of the many reasons why this is all very important for every single person on earth, not just those that might go one day to the uh, Mars uh, city or on a moon base in the coming years. I'm not just talking about designing life support systems for, for space to send this far away from earth. The research we're doing and the technologies we're developing here can also help us to solve problems here on earth. We have a problem with high CO2 concentrations. Well, algae need the CO2. We need, uh, or we have a problem with groundwater with uh, too much uh, nitrate and phosphate due to agriculture. Well, algae need that. So we can actually use the algae to purify, uh, to clean the water. And algae can, as I said, produce very efficiently with uh, less resources than other plants. So we can produce food in areas where uh, resources are scarce. So when we think about space, it's not just about sending things back uh, far away uh, to, to, to moon or Mars, but also on uh, how we can improve the, our life and uh, solve uh, some of the problems uh, we have here on Earth. And uh, with that, I come to the end of my presentation. I hope you have enjoyed this talk. Uh, it was a pleasure for me to be invited here today. Thanks again to the organizers. Here you have my uh, contact data. If you're interested in knowing more, you can uh, contact me. And I think we have some time for questions now. Thank you, Isela, for your presentation. It was amazing, this project. Um, yes, now is the time for questions. Uh, meanwhile, there are not any questions in on chat. Uh, I will ask you some um, first. Uh, we would like to know if you, since you were a girl, you already knew what you would like to become? Uh, that's a good question. And yes and no. I, when I was a little girl, I didn't want to become a veterinarian or a firefighter or an astronaut. I knew I wanted to become an engineer. And that's probably not something a little girl usually dreams about becoming. Uh, I was very curious. I, I love puzzles. I love solving problems, uh, trying to figure out how to build things or how to repair things on my own. 
So I always loved that. And I knew that engineering was the right direction. I just didn't know. I was fascinated from all engineering fields, uh, from uh, telecommunications to building bridges to up, absolutely anything sounded interesting to me. So ending up working on life support systems has been uh, the consequences of decisions I've taken over my life. I started at school designing and building small airplane models uh, with some colleagues for a school project and decided to study aerospace engineering. Then I did some space courses and started becoming fascinated about space. And since then, the fascination has just grown, grown, grown up to coming here to Germany and having a, a, an astronaut as a professor in the lectures. And uh, it has been yeah, uh, a process, I would say. And now you are like, you are solving amazing problems. <laughs> uh, another question is, Um, do you think that your career will be will have been easier if you were a man? I don't think it would be. I I have to say though that uh, I think I have been very lucky. I grew up thanks to my parents uh, playing as much with uh, with uh, the Barbies and, and other dolls. Uh, spending the same amount of time with that than uh, playing with uh, mechanical or scientific uh, toys. So since the very beginning, I have been very wide, uh, had a very wide spectrum uh, on, on this aspect. I also was very lucky at school to have teachers that, that saw the potential on me on math, physics and all these subjects and encouraged me to continue on that. Even if sometimes I wanted to do more sports or other things, they, they tried to keep me on the track. And uh, at the university, I was surprised uh, at my uh, the, the year I studied uh, aerospace engineering, one third of the students were female, which is uh, amazing for an engineering studies. That's that's. Uh, I think it was the only year. I think it decreased from that on, but uh, it was it was already giving me the right message. Like we girls can also do that. That uh, that shouldn't be a difference. So. Today I do work in a, an environment with mainly men. I don't think that we are more than 10% here where I work uh, of women. But still I have not found anyone or maybe I have I have not allowed anyone to, to treat me different because I'm, uh, I'm a woman. And uh, yeah, I do have my strengths and weaknesses like every other human does. So there's surely people that like me more, like me less, but uh, I don't want or I don't allow anyone to, to judge me uh, because uh, Uh, of being a woman, if then for what I know or, or I don't, do not know, or I can or I cannot do. And now you're encouraging a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of people to study and to work about some projects related to space. Um, another question regarding the aerospace sector. Um, how do you um, evaluate the aerospace sector, the things that could impact positive and negative in the society. Uh, well, space for me, it's just amazing. It's, I think it's hard to say negative things out of it. So let's, let's start with the positive aspects first. Well, space has always been inspiring. Uh, for thousands and thousands of years, uh, humans have looked up to the sky and because of that, asked themselves questions. And today we do not just look up to the sky, we look at uh, people landing on the moon or a Mars rover uh, landing on Mars, or we see a spacecraft going beyond the planets in our solar system. And that helps us understand a lot of things and also inspires us and shows us that everything is possible. You just have to put the right effort to it. And it is at the same time, uh, thinking about human space flight, it's a good example of cooperation. I don't think there's any other project in the world as powerful regarding cooperation as the International Space Station. We have had for 20 years people living up there with governments changing on all the countries that, that participate on the station and it still has worked. So it is, it is a good example for cooperation. And okay, those both things are more, I'm not sure, if, uh, maybe not philosophical, but they are not tangible. But if we go to a more practical way, We use GPS uh, to go to places we don't know how to get to. So it has a direct impact in our daily life, even if we don't daily realize that. And as I've 
said before, we do not only develop these technologies for space, they can also help us on Earth. So we benefit directly from the research that is done. Looking at the negative aspects, uh, I, the only thing I can think about, and I guess I'm very, very optimistic there, but uh, it is a very, it's a highly competitive sector. Um, now that uh, there's a new call of astronauts, if we look at the past call of astronauts, there they selected seven here in Europe. About 10,000 people wanted that job, and out of the 10,000, only seven made it through. So the, the, the success rate is very low. And okay, becoming a scientist, an, an engineer, or anything else on the space sector, the, the success rate is higher than that, of course. But it is still a hard, uh, highly competitive sector, I would say. But that applies also to other, um, I don't know, Formula One or other very high tech sectors, not only space. So, yeah. Thanks, Isela, for your point of view. And uh, now we have some questions in the chat. Um, Mari van der Mies asks you, hello, I'm working on LSS as an industrial partner for Melissa. I'm curious about the algae species and the type of light you used for your previous LSR experiment. Could you please tell us more about it? Yes, the algae we are using is uh, Chlorella vulgaris. It's uh, one of the two species uh, or the two potential candidates that, that could be used for space applications. The other one is Spirulina, the one that it's used in the Melissa project. And uh, I can briefly say that uh, we decided to use this algae compared to spirulina or against spirulina because it is a very robust uh, algae that can grow in, in different uh, in environments of CO2 temperature. It's, it's more easy going than, than other algaes are. It has its advantages, uh, of course. Uh, we cannot uh, just eat chlorella as it is. We have to treat it uh, before we can digest it as humans. So, all species have their advantages and disadvantages, but we saw chlorella from, especially coming from an engineer, being robust in different environments is quite important uh, concept. So uh, that's the reason why we uh, chose this, this uh, microalgae. Uh, we use blue and red LEDs. I think the other question was about the lighting. We had blue and red LEDs and we changed uh, the, the intensities of both. So we had some periods with more red and some periods with uh, uh, some periods with more blue and some people we could we could uh, choose more blue or red uh, depending on the the time we were able to change that, that. another question um do you have in mind to apply to become an astronaut i think everyone my age working in this sector is gonna apply i think it's uh i i said before i did not dream about being an astronaut when i was a child but uh for what I do now and what I have done these last 10, 12 years. Of course, it would be an amazing opportunity, but uh, I've told you the numbers from the last call. So seven out of 10,000, it's a, a very rare, uh, uh, yeah, it's a very uh, low chances of success, but I think everyone fulfilling the minimum requires that they ask because uh, not anyone can apply. You have to have at, at least a degree already and a couple of years of experience. So there are a couple of, of things that they require. But from the rest, everyone loving space should apply. It is, uh, it is a unique opportunity just to apply and leave the process. And uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's something everyone should consider. Another question, uh, Karin Brunemann asks you, salt is one of our favorite seasoning and also needed for humans. We will have salt on Mars. If so, we will, we will we get it from? Oh, that's a question I cannot answer directly. I haven't really thought too much about that, but uh, it is a good point. And uh, we, have not go, we haven't got into that much detail when we were designing our city on Mars uh, because it was a very preliminary design of, of a, a city. But it's an important point. And uh, salt is actually also very important uh, looking at uh, the experience we have on the ISS. Mars is different because we will have some gravity, but on microgravity, the taste of the astronauts is different. Uh, because of the changes we experience in uh, or astronauts experience in their bodies when in microgravity, the food does taste different and, and they tend to add some species to eat to give it more, more uh, taste. So salt uh, will surely be an important aspect and we should look into that and, and look from 
where we could obtain that from Mars. I'm not familiar with, with Mars uh, geology and, and what materials we have there. So there might be a way to get it uh, from there, I guess. I, I don't know. I can't really answer that. Mary Weaver uh, asks you, do you think there are more options of using resources that can be found on Mars for such a Mars habitat, in example, to produce energy? So we, we, we will have to use resources from Mars if we go there uh, for the one million people city, of course, because uh, that should be something completely independent from Earth, but also from smaller um, Mars bases. We will most likely rely on some resources directly there. Uh, the two things I can think first always are, or faster, the faster come to my mind, are the CO2, because we have plenty of that on the atmosphere. And there's a lot we can do on CO2. In my case, because I work on life support systems, I tend to think we will use the CO2 for the algae so they will produce more oxygen. But there, there are other applications. We can uh, extract oxygen out of it and use it as fuel. Uh, we can process it uh, and we can get uh, also carbon uh, and, and, and get other materials uh, out of it. So there is a lot of potential on that. Another interesting thing uh, for humans, but also to produce fuels uh, would be water. So we can also split water into hydrogen and oxygen or, or use it for the life support system. If we think about the algae, uh, for example, uh, we need a lot of algae liquid uh, per person. Uh, what I have here next to me is a six liter reactor. And for one human, we're probably gonna require uh, the order of magnitude of a hundred. If I can take, I have two options. I either take this water from earth with me or I, take it from the place where I'm going, the moon or, or Mars. If I can take it directly from there, I'll save some mass that I have to transport. So my rocket can be smaller. So I'm, I'm uh, saving cost there. So even for smaller bases, uh, the resources on Mars will, will become very important, of course. Thanks. Um, next question, Karthik uh, asks you, why do scientists believe dormant volcanic tubes may be the able option for future Mars colony? I have not fully understood what. Why do scientists believe dormant volcanic tubes might be a viable option for future Mars colony? I'm not sure how available they think they are, but uh, one of the things uh, to keep in mind that I have not mentioned, uh, and it's very important for survival, I, I wanted to mention that at the beginning, uh, is radiation. Uh, that's part of being able to survive on Mars. And uh, I have not mentioned it because uh, I was looking more at the life support system cycles, but radiation is something that we should consider uh, for, for long missions. And we need to get protected from radiation. And that is one of the reasons why we conceived our city inside the cliffs. That's one option that uh, we build tunnels on the cliff. Another option is to look for already existing structures uh, inside uh, or, or under the surface of Mars that can already give us this, uh, this protection and can provide us with some shelter, not just for radiation, but maybe also from, from micrometeorites impacts. And uh, I don't know if maybe also temperature, uh, play a little bit of temperature um, isolation and things like that. So it, it uh, might be a good place to build the structures we decided to go uh, on this project for this uh, tunnels on the cliffs. But yeah, radiation is an important keyword that, uh, that uh, yeah. Marsule, as you, uh, thank you for this amazing presentation in the first place. Is your department working in parallel with projects focused here, here on the earth as well? Or do you have a synergy with one? We are working with uh, Earth applications. We are mainly financed by the German Aerospace Center here. And the German Aerospace Center, uh, which depends from the, the, ger the German uh, uh, government, uh, is focusing a lot as well on these Earth applications, how we can, in parallel to developing technologies for space, we can develop them from, for, for Earth. And we do that. We have a project, uh, as I mentioned before, we have a problem with groundwater having too high nitrate and phosphate uh, levels. Uh, here in Germany, it's a problem, but I think pretty much everywhere because of the amount of uh, nutrients that are, are given uh, in, in agricultural fields. So we are working on how we apply the knowledge we got designing algae systems, very efficient systems, 
here on Earth as well. So we are we are all the time looking at at both. Uh, our focus is space. We're called Institute of Space Systems, but uh, we always keep the the Earth applications also in mind because that's also what uh, uh, currently uh, potential um, uh, the the people that pay us, the potential people that may pay us for the projects, are also interested in and in looking at both aspects. Mary Weaver asked the last question. Um, do you think that a habitat on Mars is the best way forward to explore habitats in space? Or do you think that there are other options that could be more interesting? I, I'm not sure I fully understood it. If, if you, do you think that uh, an habitat on Mars is the best way forward to explore habitats in space? Or do you think there are other options that could be more interesting? I'm, I'm still not understanding it. If uh, the Mars habitat are, is the best option? Yes, to explore habitats in the space. To explore space. Uh, well, uh, what options do we have? Uh, we can build a habitat on the moon. We can build a habitat on Mars. We can build a station uh, at some point in there. I don't think that in the coming years or decades we will go farther away than that. So I, I think it's quite restricted to, uh, yeah, Mars, Moon, uh, maybe an asteroid, uh, human mission, but I wouldn't build a base there or a base floating somewhere in microgravity. Both in Mars and Moon, from the human point of view. Uh, another thing is uh, what is best for research or things like that. But from a human point of view, it's very interesting to have gravity even if it's partial gravity, that makes a lot of things easier and a lot of process, processes easier than compare of being in microgravity. Then from a scientific point of view, I, I'm not gonna say that Mars is the destination we have to go. I, I, I'm quite open to uh, moon further moon exploration as a first step to then go to Mars. So Mars is not the final destination or the final solution. It's one of the steps we'll, hopefully go over the next decades. Might be the moon first. I've worked in this Mars project because it was a competition for the Mars Society, uh, Society, so we focused on Mars. But I am also working a lot towards moon and how to uh, design algae systems for a moon base. So I, I wouldn't say it is the solution or the destination Mars, but uh, there's more than that. And the final question, Gisela, to close the, this conference. Um, do you want to transmit uh, any message to the new generations? Yeah, sure. Uh, I think it's very important that uh, whatever passion you may have, uh, space or anything else, it's very important that you find what you're good at related to it and fight for it. So in, in space sector, we need all kinds of disciplines. We need uh, engineers like me, we need scientists, we need biologists, but we also need uh, psychologists, we need architects, we need journalists. So if your passion is space, find the, the one thing that you're good at and fight for it. And it, it's important that you know, that everyone knows uh, their own limitations because we all have them. We, there's no one person that it's perfect at everything. Uh, but it's important that uh, you are aware of them and uh, you don't let others tell you what you can or cannot achieve. Uh, just go for it, uh, work hard, that's, uh, that's a must, uh, nothing comes for free, and just become the best at it. And um, well, even if you're the best at something and if you work as hard as you can, you might still do mistakes and uh, most likely things are going to go wrong at some point. Uh, we had our technical problems with our experiment. That was a hard uh, moment for us, but uh, that's okay. These things can happen. What's important is that we learn from them and that we keep fighting after them, that uh, we do not give up. And uh, maybe last uh, added to that too, in the way of becoming the best on whatever you want to do, uh, keep in mind always that you're not alone. Uh, there's people around you that they might need you, but most importantly, you will most likely need them too. So I think that, that uh, yeah, this, this 
three aspects are very important for anyone, girl or boy, uh, trying to push their dreams. Uh, work hard, trust yourself, and, and keep always the, the cooperation in mind because it, it will need to happen. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks, Gisela, for these this inspiring words and your, in, your incredible work. We are your fans and we are, you are really a, a potential astronaut and, and hoping that you, you reach the stars. Thank you very much for your time thank and you. for everything. Thank, for, uh, thank you everybody for, to share with us this talk and see you next, next month for the new inspiring talk. Thank you, bye.